Good morning, glad that you're here. Alrighty, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. And yeah, I think it's a little dark, but I think we're gonna push on. I kinda like, we're just gonna go with it. Okay, so we are gonna be in Second Chronicles 26 through 28 this morning. And I hope you guys had a great weekend. I had a great weekend. Um, did a photo booth one of those that you know you're like this is just not going how I planned and you know not everything always goes how we planned and so it was not one of our best photo booths not because of us but because of the venue's ability to provide a great photo booth so we did the best we could with what we had and we went on from there yeah and then yesterday was just a day of Jimmy and I, and it was pretty awesome. So, well, let's go ahead and open in prayer, and we'll get started. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that um, it is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, meaning that it will cut through what's real and what's not, and it will show us who we are and what we need to do. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us to be what you've called us to be and to do what you've called us to do. And thank you so much for this day and your mercy that's new every morning. And thank you for who you are and all that you've done for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. All right. Again, Second Chronicles 26 through 28. Uzziah reigns in Judah. So, and all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah um, after the king slept with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he began, began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Very few of them did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Most of them did evil as their fathers had done, right? And so this is a big deal. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah. Good morning, whoever's watching. Who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And that is no different than us today. As long as we seek the Lord, we will prosper. As long as we seek who God is and what God has for us, we will succeed. And he went out and made war against the Philistines and broke through the wall of Gath and the wall of Jabneh and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities in the territory of Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistine and against the Arabians who lived in Gerbal and against the Mennonites. The Ammonites paid tribute to Uzziah and his fame spread to the border of Egypt, for he became very strong. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the angle and fortified them. And he built towers in the wilderness and cut out many cisterns, for he had large herds both in the Shephelah and in the plain. And he had farmers and vine dressers in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of soldiers fit for war and divisions according to the numbers and the muster made by Jael, the secretary, and Messiah, Mes, 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 Masia, the officer under the direction of Hananiah, one of the king's commanders. The whole number of the heads of the fathers' houses of mighty men of valor was 2,600. Under their command was an army of 307,500. Who could make war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy? So he's got people in the fields growing his stuff and taking care of his herds. He's got mighty men of valor that are out there and doing their thing and and protecting him and fighting battles and keeping his borders safe and all that good stuff. And Uzziah prepared for all the army shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows, and stones for slinging. So then he supplied all his army. Then he made sure they all had weapons. In Jerusalem, he made engines invented by 
In Jerusalem he made engines invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and great stones. I don't think I ever read that before. He made engines invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and great stones. Like a machine gun. How crazy is that? I don't think I've ever really met... Well, I'm sure I've read it. I've read the whole Bible before, but it's funny because things stick out that you either don't remember or they mean something different to you now because God's word is alive and powerful. And his fame spread far for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Uzziah's pride and punishment. So all good things must come to an end, right? So here we go. Uzziah's pride and punishment. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction, for he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor. So these were not just pushover priests. These were men of valor that were ready to fight and not just fight anybody, but fight the king. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who were consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and when he became angry with the priests, Leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. Good morning, whoever's watching. And they rushed him out quickly and he himself hurried to go out because the Lord had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper, leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham his son was the king over the king, was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, from first to last, Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, wrote. And Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the burial field that belonged to the kings, for they said he is a leper. And Jotham his son reigned in his place. This is a reminder of the times when we get to where we feel we have done this amazingly awesome thing and that we have the power within us and it's all because of who we are and what we've done and truly it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with God. And God is the one that's in control. And God is the one that does and perseveres. And God is the one that should get the honor and glory. And because Uzziah chose to not give that honor and glory to God, his health was taken from him. So we need to make sure that we're right with God, right? And we have the right motives and the right heart. Jotham reigns in Judah. Now Jotham was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jershua, the daughter of Zadok, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father Uzziah had done, except he did not enter the temple of the Lord. Let's just be clear. But the people still followed corrupt practices. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord and did much building on the wall of Ophel. Moreover, he built cities in the hill country of Judah and forts and towers on the wooded hills, and he fought with the king of the Ammonites and prevailed against them. And the, the Ammonites gave him that year 100 talents of silver and 10,000 cores of wheat and 10,000 of barley. The Ammonites paid him the same amount in the second and the third years, so Josh, Jotham became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord God. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all his wars and his ways, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And Jotham slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Ahaz his son reigned in his place. Okay, 
So now we see that um, all of the acts of Uzziah and Ahab, uh, Uzziah and Jotham are written in the book of Isaiah. And we, book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Oh, book of kings. So we've already heard a lot about Jotham because, and Jotham and Uzziah, because we read about it in First and Second Kings. So when we're done with First and Second Kings, now we're in First and Second Chronicles. So there you go. And now we're going to hear about Ahaz reigns in Judah. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. What a bummer to end on someone that is not doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord, right? He did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He even made metal images for the balls. And he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his sons as an offering. According to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. So he not only didn't follow God's direction, he flat out worshipped idols. He killed his sons on the altar. He's definitely not a good man, right? And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So this is not good because the king is not following after God. So what's going to happen to the people? Judah is going to be defeated. So here we go. Verse 5. Therefore the Lord is God gave him into the hand of the king of Syria who defeated him and took captive a great number of his people and brought them to Damascus and he was also given into the hand of the king of Israel. Remember because Israel and Judah were split. Israel was separated from Judah and now he was given into the hand of the king of Israel who struck him with great force. For Pekah the son of Ramalia, king of a hundred, oh no, for Pekah the son of Ramalia killed a hundred and twenty thousand from Judah in one day, all of them men of valor, because they had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers. When we forsake God, God allows us to be forsaken. When we choose to turn our back on God, God allows us to turn our back on him which means we are without refuge, we are without hope, we are without strength, because all that comes from God. So because they had turned their back on God, they were forsaken. And Zikri, a man of Ephraim, killed Masiah, the king's son, and Azrakam, the commander of the palace, and Elkanah, the next in authority to the king. So his lack of care and following of God's instruction led to the death of many, the, the captivity of many, and the death of his son. The men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters. They also took much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded, and he went out to meet them, meet the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand, but you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. Okay, so when we are not right with God, God uses people and situations to bring us into a right place with him again. But the people that usually, the people or situations that usually have to bring us into that place usually don't get blessed because of it because they are attacking the children of god god is never happy with them and so now um you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven and now you intend to subjugate the people of judah and jerusalem male and female as your slaves have you not sins of your own against the lord your god now hear me and send back the captives from your relatives whom you have taken for you for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. I don't know about you, but I do not want the fierce wrath of the Lord upon me. That doesn't sound good at all. Certain chiefs, also the men of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Jehanan, Bechariah, the son of 
Meshilamoth, Je <laughs> Jehizekiah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Hadali, stood up against those who were coming from the war and said to them, You shall not bring the captives in here, for you propose to bring upon us guilt against the Lord in addition to our present sins and guilt. So these guys got it. These guys understood if these people come here, we're going to get smoked by God and we don't want any part of it. So send them back. Um, for our guilt is already great and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the assembly. And the men who have been mentioned by name above, by name, rose and took the captives. And with the spoil they clothed all who were naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them food and drink, and anointed them, carrying all the feeble among them on donkeys, and brought them to their kinsfolk at Jericho, the city of palm trees. And then they returned to Samaria. So, the people of Israel, 6.30, sorry. The people of Israel did not want to bring this upon them. They did not want to curse themselves with doing more wrong. And so they treated the captives kindly. They helped them and got them back to their homeland. So at that time, King Ahaz sent to the king of Assyria for help for the Edomites had again invaded and defeated Judah and carried away captives. And the Philistines had made raids on the city of Shephla and the Negev of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh, Agilon, Gedaroth, Soko with its villages, Timnah with its villages, Gimzo with its villages, and they settled there. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he made Judah act sinfully and had been very unfaithful to the Lord. Ahaz had made Judah act sinfully. Ahaz made them act sinfully because he was their leader and he did not provide godly counsel or godly direction. So he was held accountable for what happened to them. So Tiglath, Tiglath Pilizar, king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. For Ahaz took a portion from the house of the Lord and the house of the king and of the princes and gave tribute to the king of Assyria. But it did not help him. Why did it not help him? Because he was not right with God. Because giving to try and fix something doesn't make it right, right? Trying to fix it with things doesn't make it right. God doesn't desire your offerings. God desires your obedience, right? So Ahaz's idolatry in verse 22. In the time of his distress, he became yet more faithless to the Lord. His na this name, this same King Ahaz. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus that had defeated him and said, because, of, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. Yeah, poor logic. He needed to sacrifice to God so God would help him, right? Um, but they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. And he shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. He made himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem and in every city of Judah he made high places to make offerings to other gods, provoking to anger the Lord, the God of his fathers. I don't know what he was thinking. Now the rest of his acts and all his ways from first to last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Ahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of Jerusalem, for they did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel. Wow. Now that's a different one, too, because everybody, descendants from the king, were buried in the tombs of the kings. But he is not, because he is so evil, and they just buried him in the city. They're like, we, we, we don't even want you with, <laughs> with the other kings because you're so bad and you're going to rub off on them. So Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. And hopefully we'll find out tomorrow that if Hezekiah was a good king or a bad king. So we're going to end with Hezekiah in our Old Testament reading. And we're going to go on to Romans 13, which is submission to the authorities. Submission to the authorities. 
Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. Okay, that's a hard statement because many people feel not all leadership is good. You know, there was like, there was Hitler, <laughs> right? There's Stalin, Mussolini, you know, and then current leaders that were just not very good, right? And we, we read that and we say, well, he wasn't God's servant for good. Well, you know, what came out of his rule, their rules, what came out of the fact that they ruled their people and maybe they specifically weren't good and maybe the acts they did specifically weren't good, but God allowed them for a good. There was good that came out of that situation. Maybe we don't see it in the situation. Maybe we don't see it even after the situation. But as time tells, we look back on those situations and we see the good that God brought from it, that he was not going to be able to bring about any other way. Why? He is God. He can do all things. Yes, but we are human and we also have free will. And because of our humanity and our free will, sometimes the only way to bring about the good is to go through the bad. And that's what God does. God can turn all things for good for those that love him, for those that are called according to his purpose. And he is God's servant for your good. Whether you see it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you hold fast to that truth or not. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. If you are wrong and you're go doing wrong against your authority, he, that authority is in place for a reason. So you're going to end up going against the authority, which is never a good place to be, right? For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. We owe taxes, money, respect, and honor to our authorities whether we feel they deserve it or not. Does that mean that we should follow and, and subjugate ourselves under authority when that authority is contrary to the word of God and is causing us to sin? That's between you and God. And there is a point in time that will come, especially in end times, where you will have to make a choice between following the authority and choosing God and choosing to follow after him and choosing to, to, to forsake what the leadership is telling you. We are not to that point yet, even though life seems pretty bleak, um, but we can see it not here in this country, but in other countries where the Christians go underground. Those that, that love and follow after God, they worship and follow after God underground. And because of that, they do suffer the consequences for that. And I, I believe and I know and I can trust that God is with those that suffer in those situations because they are suffering for the good. So we need to trust that God is in control of all those things even when we don't understand it, right? Okay, so the next one is fulfilling the law through love. Owe oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. This is it. Okay, everybody wonders, what's my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing here? I don't know what God's purpose is for me. This is your purpose. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The other one was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And this is the second part, to love your neighbor as yourself. We are not to judge our neighbor as ourselves because if that was the case, we would never judge our neighbor because we never want to judge ourselves. It's never our fault, but someone else's fault, right? So we are not called to judge. We are called to love. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I'm telling you, we love ourselves a whole heck of a lot more than we think. If you really think about it, you love yourself a lot. So love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Judgment is not the fulfilling of the law. Sacrifice is not the fulfilling of the law. Doing, doing, doing is not the fulfilling of the law. Love, love is the fulfilling of the law. And all God's called us to do is love. So love. Love those around you. Love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is those that are around you. Be it in your family. Be it next door. Be it at church. Be it at work or at school. Those are your neighbors. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Wake up from the sleep of your lack of devotion and care and trust in God. Wake up, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed in our lifetime. And this was written 2,000 years ago, a little bit less than 2,000 years ago because it was after Jesus had already died. Salvation is nearer now than it was then, right? So the night is far gone and the day is at hand. The day is Jesus Christ returning for his people, a saying, having us come and meet him in the clouds, a standing before God and saying, well, he's saying, well done, good and faithful servant, right? The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Casting off the works of darkness is doing the things that are not pleasing to God. Doing and living and thinking and being in a way that is contrary to the armor of light. What is the armor of light? The armor of light is the armor of God. It's being in the word. It's being in prayer. It's sharing the word. It's being right. It's doing what God has called you to do, which is what? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. There you go. What am I supposed to do? You're supposed to love God and love others. You're supposed to flee from the things that are contrary to God and embrace the things that are of God. So that's where we're going to leave our New Testament reading and go into our Psalms reading, which is Psalms 23. This was the first piece of scripture I remember memorizing. I think I've probably had Bible verses before this, but I remember being in kindergarten and I remember memorizing Psalms 23. And I got my new American Standard Bible at Temple Baptist School in Norwalk. And, um, it was significant. It was a big deal. Psalms 23 is pretty long for a kindergartner. And um, it was a foundation that changed my life. So don't think that Bible memorization is, is not important to kids. It's really important to kids because as you become an adult, it's what a child would hold on to. Those words would come back to me. So let's read through it. The Lord is my shepherd. And this is a Psalm of David. David being the King David that we've been reading about where he, they would go and sleep with their fathers in the tomb of, of their King David. And King David was the man after God's own heart. And those under his lineage that followed after God were blessed. So let's start in Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So what do we see here? He's our shepherd. He guides us. He protects us. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He makes us lie down and get 
the nourishment that we need. He leads me beside still waters, still waters that bring refreshment to our souls, but don't bring fear to our hearts. To, he wouldn't have us lay down next to a raging river because that wouldn't give us peace to our souls, right? He lies us down next to still waters so we can get refreshed. He restores your soul. He doesn't tear you down. He builds you up. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Why would he lead you into the right way? For his name's sake. Because he is who he is. He is the Lord God. He leads us in the right way. Now this is a big one and this is stuck with me and this is what I counsel other people with because it's so true. Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even though I walk through the valley. God doesn't say he's going to remove you from the valley. God doesn't say you have to go, he's going to allow you to go around the valley. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we have to walk through the valley. We have to walk through it. We can't stop and sit down and give up. That's, that's not God's best or purpose for us. Our purpose is to walk through. We have to go through that valley. Why? Because it takes us in the shadow of death. It takes us to the place where we understand that we are temporary and God is eternal. But we don't have to fear evil. We don't have to fear the darkness that's around us. Why? Because God's with us. God is with us. God cares. God has not left us. We are not alone walking through that valley. His rod and his staff comfort us. His rod is used to defend us. His staff is used to guide us. A staff is the shepherd's hook. And that was used to wrangle those sheep and bring them in. So his rod defends us. His staff directs us. And that's a comfort. Because even though I'm walking through this valley, even though I'm in this very dark place, he is protecting me. He is guiding me. I am not alone. He is with me. And that's what we need to cling to, right? Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Now that might not sound fun at all. I don't know about you, but I really don't want to have dinner with my enemies. But he prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Meaning that he prepares for me having to be in front of those that are not for me. He prepares you when you have to stand before those that are not your friends, that you're going to have to stand for who you are. He prepares that. He prepares that table before you in the presence of your enemies. We sometimes have to sit down at a table that is not pleasant, but God is there and God has prepared it. It is not accidental. It is not without purpose. God has prepared you to sit down at that table with those you don't like and that may not like you. But guess what? He will anoint my head with oil. Your cup, of, my cup overflows. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. So even though I'm before these people that I don't like and they don't like me, he's going to bless me. He's going to anoint me. He's going to give me exactly what I need and exactly the time I need it. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy. Surely, absolutely, positively, without a shadow of a doubt. Surely means only, only goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. How beautiful is that? Mercy is, another word for mercy is steadfast love. Your mercy and your steadfast love, your goodness and your steadfast love shall follow me. Absolutely. Only your goodness and your steadfast love. God has good intentions for you. God has steadfast love for you. God's mercy is new every morning. Great is his faithfulness to us, right? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We are not alone. God has not forsaken you. 
God loves you more than you love yourself. And God loves those that are suffering in that situation that you're in more than you can love them. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because this is not my home. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. This, this, is, this is not your home. And God has prepared something far greater than you could possibly imagine for you that is a dwelling place of the Lord forever. Take hold of that. Believe it. Trust it. Live in it. Know it. Don't doubt. Right? Okay, this is going to end our readings for today. Proverbs 20, verse 11. Even a child makes himself known by his acts. But whether his conduct is pure, by whether his conduct is pure and upright. Even a child makes himself known by his acts. So you know a kid by what he does. Whether what he does is pure and upright, and we only have verse 11. So the opposite of pure and upright would be evil and bad, right? So you know a kid by what he does. You know a person by what they do. It doesn't say that we're not to love them, right? It doesn't say that we are to judge them, right? They're known by what they do, good or bad, they're known. That's not for us to judge. It doesn't say that know them by their acts and don't love them, it's not what it says. It says you're known and yes, I've been argued with that scripture to, well, we're required to judge the fruit. We have to judge the fruit. Well, okay, you fruit judgers, we're not, we're not here to judge fruit. We're here to love people. So whether their fruit looks bad or good, we're to love them, right? And so whether a child's acts are pure and upright, pure and upright or evil and bad, we're called to love them, right? So we need to love people through where they're at, not judge people in where they're at because God is not designed for them to stay where they're at. God has called for them to walk through where they're at, right? Just like us. So I hope that touches a chord with somebody today. It actually blesses my heart too. So um, thank you for your time. I hope that you have a very blessed day and like and share the message. And um, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. We'll talk to you guys later.